I say, are you glad to be here this morning? <laughs> Do you like the sunshine? Three months ago, we were two feet deep in snow. You ought to be glad you're here this morning. It was a little white around here three months ago this time. So I'm glad that you're glad that you're here. This morning, I was reading my Read the Bible Through. Let me encourage you. If you're still reading the Bible through, press on, brother. Press on. Sister, press on. If you've given up, oh, preacher, I'm so far behind. I'm so far behind I can see my own backside. Well, if you're behind, just jump in where you are. It's okay. You know, God doesn't have a, a big blackboard where he's marking off what you've done wrong about your Bible reading. Just jump in and read where you are. Continue to read. You're never going to get hurt by reading the Bible. Even if you're out of sequence, who cares? Jump back in it. I was reading it this morning, and that psalm that I quoted at the beginning of worship is from today's Bible reading, but listen to this. Judges chapter 2. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. And they followed the various gods and the peoples around them. They provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and served the Baals and the Ashtaroths. And so you begin to read the Judges and how the people of Israel would forsake God. They'd forget about him. A new generation would rise up and they'd forget. And they'd do their own thing. Worship the gods of their culture. Who sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? And then God would deliver them when they'd cry out to him. So we see this over and over again. But read the Bible. Read the Bible through if you can. Jump in where you are. Just read the Bible. By the way, that's mine. That's not for someone else to pick up. I know last week I gave away books, but that's, please don't take that away. I'd be lost and I couldn't read the Bible. Then I'd be mad. Let's pray together. Father, it is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning to share this time with each other, but especially with you. And Lord, you have a word for us. You may have spoken it to us while we sang this morning. You may have spoken that word to us while we were giving our gifts this morning. You may have spoken that word to us in a quiet moment. You may have spoken that word to us while we were greeting someone. But we all know, Father, that when we are open... You will speak to us through your word. So allow us to have ears to hear and hearts to take in as we listen to your word and share with it this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. What season of the year is it? Easy question. Spring, it's spring. In spring, we look forward to warmer temperatures, the new flowers, the new growth. We don't look forward to the pollen and the allergies, but we'll go past that. We also think about cleaning up after a long, long winter. And so we've been talking about spring cleaning last week and this week. We started that two-part series. Last week, we focused on Matthew chapter 6, and then also Matthew chapter 12. Jesus says there, But do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt, but lay up treasures in heaven. And so we saw what it means to clean out all that stuff in our lives and lay up treasures in heaven. As we continue this theme of spring cleaning, let me give you some interesting, at least to me, statistics. It's a 22 billion, with a B, dollar a year business. 58,000 plus units, of which almost all of them exclusively are in the United States. It compromises 2.3 billion square feet are used now put that in perspective 2.3 billion square feet is about the distance in in miles from the earth to neptune in our solar system huge amount of square feet almost 10 percent of all the homes in america use these close to 200,000 people are employed in this industry anyone have a guess what it is Self-storage units. Self-storage units. We have 
so much stuff that we have actually built an industry. By the end of the 1960s, this industry did not exist. It has happened within the last few years that we built this industry and we put our extra stuff that we can't get in our houses in storage units. Now you say, well, I read a statistics where the majority of storage units are for businesses for their seasonal stuff. That's how it started. But the majority today of storage units are by people with so much stuff. So much stuff. Now look at this picture. This one here. Or this one. This picture. Now what's wrong with this picture? Anybody take, take a good look. What's wrong with this picture? No. What's wrong with this picture? They're smiling. When you got all that stuff, you may smile to start, but then you get more stuff and more stuff and more stuff. And soon the smile becomes a frown because we have so much stuff that we deal with. This self-storage industry is, is so much of the stuff we have. Now keep that in mind as we go through this message this morning, as we look at spring cleaning. Everything, everything, all systems over time accumulate stuff. Rivers become silted over, full of silt, and so we have to dredge the rivers. It's not just the big rivers, even small rivers become dredged. We have to dredge them out because of the silt. You know that, that ships at sea, whether they're fishing ships or aircraft carriers, become encrusted with barnacles over a period of time. I read a statistic that says in one year, an ocean-going oil tanker can accumulate over five tons of barnacles. So they have to be scraped off, become encased in that. Now, before I show you the next slide, it has an ew factor, okay? Ew. Ew. Well, you know what they are? Arteries. Over time, without care, our veins and arteries become encrusted. They become uh, clogged up. Even our own bodies become clogged and restrict the blood flow. Now, I didn't take this picture here, but even closets in churches get clogged up with stuff. You can find vacation Bible school records from 1926. Or you can find uh, uh, leftover buckets of sand from some event. Uh, I'm not saying in our church. Of course, that would never happen here. But closets. We get clogged up with stuff. This is a problem. This is a problem we all know and we all live with. All physical systems, whether it's rivers or whether it's ships, or whether it's our arteries or even closets, eventually get filled with stuff that need to be cleaned out. And if not cleaned out, eventually the whole system breaks down. Now, this, this system, this reality, is a reality, not just in the physical realm. You, all, you and I both know that relationships, if they're not maintained, they will fall apart, they will decay. I mean, guys, just don't talk to your spouse for a week. Maybe, back that up, a day. And it's going to start to deteriorate real, real quick. So we see it not only in physical systems, but also in relationships. And let me say to you, this is especially true of our spiritual lives. Over time, if we're not careful, our lives can become cluttered and clogged up with the debris of sin. Our minds, our hearts can become encrusted if you will, with the barnacles of ungodly belief and ungodly sin. It hinders our relationship with God. It hinders our fellowship with each other. It hinders our ability to experience the joy and the peace that comes with living with and for Jesus. Let me say that again. This stuff, this sin that clutters our lives, if not cared for, will hinder our relationship with God, our fellowship with each other, our ability to experience the joy and peace that comes from walking with Jesus. So if it's true, and it is, then what do we do about it? Well, let me say something up front. This process of sin building up, debris building up in our lives is very, very gradual. 
And it's common to everyone. Not one of us are safe from this. Nobody here can say, well, that's never happened to me. Or it's never going to happen to me. None of us can afford to be casual about this. And the scriptures are full of it. Just, just a couple of examples. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is a wellspring of life. Psalm 141, verses 3 and 4. Guard, set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Let not my heart be drawn to what is evil. In the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. Ephesians 5, 15. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. These and other passages tell us we need to be careful about our spiritual lives and give ongoing attention to our walk with Christ. If not, over time, ungodly attitudes, actions, and habits will creep in, and often we don't even realize that it's happening. Here's a reality we cannot afford to ignore. When someone's spiritual life gets clogged and falls apart, it's not an immediate thing. It's usually gradual. Little by little, the spiritual life begins to lessen. There's a, a zeal and a zest of knowing God becomes slighter. And spiritual activities, Bible reading and prayer and fellowship and ministry starts to become dull and uninteresting. And, and what, what used to be a blessing seems to be a burden. Oh, we, we rationalize it, don't we? Well, I'm, I'm just so busy. Well, man, you should see my kid's schedule. They keep me jumping. Or those people in church just don't do it right. We become critical of others and critical of his church. We no longer care to spend time with Christian friends. And, and it permeates what we do. I have a friendship with a lady who, who is very angry with God about something that happened in her family. And she's so bitter about it that she takes it out on everyone around her and can't see that it's a spiritual problem. She's allowed that, that junk and debris of sin in her life to take over. It's a reality that we see here. We see it in the church oftentimes. We just no longer care to spend time with Christian friends. The world seduces us us and it is the debris that 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 clogs our spiritual lives that becomes the easiest i got a lot more to do our tolerance for the ungodly in our heart and in our mind and in our conduct gradually decreases and our concern about avoiding sin no longer seems important we can rationalize it or as a famous pastor of this church used to say we buy right into the doctrine of justification terry douglas we rationalize it we justify it yeah but you don't know what they said to me yeah but you don't know what happened yeah but yeah but i'm busy yeah but and pretty soon we start to get clogged up we rationalize which brings us to our passage of this morning if you have your bible turn with me Proverbs chapter 24. Now, I know that Proverbs isn't normally a place we go to. Seems odd. Pastor Steve's out of Proverbs this morning? Wow, that's, that's really strange. But in Proverbs, Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, observed a reality that, that, that we know, but oftentimes may not apply to our spiritual walk, our spiritual lives. Look in Proverbs, chapter 24, verses 30 through 34. Let me read those as you follow. I went by the field of a lazy man, and by the vineyard of a man devoid of understanding. And there it was, all overgrown with thorns, its surface covered with nettles, its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Now, we might want to, on the surface, take this as being someone who's just lazy. And it's true. On the surface, this is a lazy man 
who isn't willing to put the work in and the maintenance in time and time over again to make sure that his field is well, that his crops are being raised, that his, that his wall is sturdy and, and held up. It takes maintenance to do those things. But look a little deeper at that. Because if we apply our spiritual lives to this, we can see what happens. I went by the field of a lazy man, the vineyard of a man devoid of understanding, and there it was, all grown up with thorns. Do you realize, and I know it's hard to believe those of you who raise a garden, but, but weeds and thorns don't grow overnight. Now, it seems like it when you're raising a garden, doesn't it? But, but real deep-rooted seeds and thorns, they, they take their time. They start small, and they grow. They may grow fast, but they grow. And the surface of our spiritual lives gets covered. Stone walls just don't decide one day, well, I'm going to fall down. Well, they might fall down one day, but if you look at it closely, under them, the foundation has been washed away or rotted away or something has happened, and that stone wall falls down. It doesn't happen overnight, but it happens because we are not careful with what God has given. So, so Solomon sees this, and, 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 and he learns something from it. A little sleep, a little sum, slumber, a little holding our, hand, folding our hands in rest. Here is not paying attention to what we have. Finding other things that are more important. And I've often heard, heard people say, I'm just so tired. Well, yeah, we're tired. But are we tired spiritually and not taking the time to rest in Him? Not taking the time to do the maintenance that's there. So your poverty will come like a prowler and your need like an armed man coming against you is what he means here. Here, decay is a gradual process. It takes time combined with, combined with neglect, complacency, a lack of care before we realize it. Especially in our spiritual lives, we become choked with the thorns of our walk with God that falls into ruins. The reality is that often by the time we realize it or it comes to our attention, we may have become so used to it that we may not care to change. We may not see it. So we just continue to store up the useless and non-productive stuff in our lives. Remember the storage units? That becomes us. We fill the spaces that we think we need all this stuff in our lives, so we clutter our spirit, and eventually it overtakes us. And you know what we need to do? We need to expand into another area of our life and let that be taken over. We need to buy another storage unit. And so we fill our lives with all kinds of stuff that, that do not give us fulfillment. I have a slide that I didn't, didn't use this morning. I just now thought of it. I have a slide of a hearse going down the street with a U-Haul attached to it. You've seen that? That's just crazy. I remember Billy Graham, when, when, uh, when Howard Hughes died, who was a billionaire, when he died, Billy Graham said there was no U-Haul behind the hearse because you can't take it with you. But the stuff we accumulate, if we're not careful, it becomes us. Okay, Pastor, so if this is true, and if I'm honest, I have seen myself here, what do I do? Well, the good news is, help is available. God has given us a reality, a presence to help us in this very real dilemma. Listen to the words of Jesus. He said them in John 16, 7 and 8. But I tell you the truth. It is good for you that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit here. And he says, when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Listen to me. We quote this verse for those heathen, pagan sinners out there, that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of the guilt of their sin when Jesus is speaking to us to convict us of the guilt that, and the sin we let build up in us. And the Holy Spirit is there as our helper to clean out the spiritual systems that have become clogged and filled up with the ungodly. And we often sing this song, Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior. Know my heart, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. 
But do you realize that that hymn comes from a song of David based on Psalm 139? From the depths of his heart, David prays this prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me on the way everlasting. And how honest is that? How honest is that to, to get on your face before holy God and be open and say, God, show me my sin. Most of us aren't willing to do that. Oh, we may put cursory words to it. Oh, Lord, you know, help me out. I'm a sinner. But are we willing to fall on our face and say, Lord, show me my sin? Search me, O oh God. Clean out my heart. Are we really open to allow the Holy Spirit to show us our true selves, barnacles and all, and let Him clean us up? Right now, we're being called to a real spiritual spring cleaning, if you will. Facing our real sin is something we often avoid. We give it lip service. Oh yes, I know, I'm a sinner. But facing our real sin, that's a real problem. God often sends us warning signs about the buildup of debris and sin in our lives, and it may come from a spouse or, or a friend, or, or far be it to believe, even from a sermon. But we won't hear it, or we won't see it. We often refuse to listen to the correction. We change the subject, or we attack the message, or we attack the messenger. We deny the sin or redefine it or justify it or has become common in our society, we just rename it so it sounds good. No, we don't lie. We misspeak or stretch the truth. We don't cheat. We don't become critical. We just have higher standards. And over and over again, we rename sin so it doesn't sound so bad, even when we know that it's wrong. Now, do we really need the Holy Spirit to reveal sin to us? Yes. He can speak to us through various means. I mentioned through a sermon or a book or a friend's counsel and certainly through the Scriptures. But in order for us to hear His voice, it is essential that we pray and ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us. My friends, this is not something that's man-made. This is not something you can do on your own. I grew up in a generation, we were taught... Man, you pull yourself up from your, with your bootstraps. You get it done. Don't worry about what life has dealt you. You get it done. This is not something that you can do on your own. It comes by faith. We need the Holy Spirit because we have a great capacity for self-deception. Listen to me. We, can tr we can't trust our heart to tell us the truth when we ourselves are the subject of of the investigation we are not impartial judges of our own motives and our own conduct just as we can be surrounded by clutter in our own homes and not even notice it so we need God's help to see the clutter and debris in our own lives the good news or bad news depending on your perspective is that by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit we can see ourselves from God's point of view and we can see what God sees. And we can change and make the difference. So what do you need to do when God answers your prayer and begins to open up your eyes to those areas of your life that need to be cleaned out? Well, it's something like when you get ready for someone to visit your home. Now, all of you can relate to this. Hey, coming to visit you next week. What's the first thing you do? Click. Oh, my word, look at this place. Look at this house. Well, the first thing we do is we probably get mad at ourselves for letting it get that way and everybody else in the house for letting it get that way. And then we get a plan. We get it cleaned up. We get it presentable for someone who's coming to visit. But we can't avoid the reality that we have to do something and do it now. Listen. James chapter 1, starting in verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and 
after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forget what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. James is saying that when you look at the Word and let the Holy Spirit convict and show you those areas of your life that need to be cleaned out, then the time is now to do something about what you see in the mirror. We can excuse it. We can rationalize it. We can ignore it. We can justify it. But the reality is we are sinners. And left on our own, we fill our lives with unrighteousness. To this condition that we all have, Jesus says, come. Come. Today is the day. Today is the day to get your heart cleaned. Now, for some of you here this morning, that's not something you've done. You haven't even started. And, and the place to start is not by getting out the spiritual furniture polish or the spiritual vacuum cleaner. The place you start is the simple answer that we give every time we talk about this. Any question we give, the answer is, you start with Jesus. You start with Him. Have you, in your heart and in your life, understood that you're a sinner and that your life is cluttered with sin? Oh, you may say, well, I'm not as bad as this guy. The standard isn't this guy. The standard is a holy God who is perfect and holy. And standing before Him, we... We know we're sinners. What we have done in our lives and said and thought and acted upon is ungodly. And the Bible calls it sin. But Jesus says there is a way. For He came and died on the cross to forgive your sins. And on that glorious Easter morning, He rose from the dead so that you could have life uncluttered forever. Have you accepted Him? Do you know Him as your Savior, your Lord? The one who has cleaned your life and made you whole. If not, to today he says come. Come and right here, right now, you can get that spring cleaning for eternity. Let him come and clean your heart. Just ask him to come in, forgive your sin, and fill your heart. He will. My Christian friend, the reality is that we as believers allow ourselves to get cluttered up with stuff. Oh, it doesn't. It's just a little bit at a time, a little bit here, a little bit there. But are you willing to pray that prayer, search me, O oh God, and know my heart today? Are you willing to allow this, this spring cleaning, if you will, to take place in you? Here's a, a fact that I learned a few years ago. It's played out over and over and over again. If you start to clean out your house, if it's cluttered, let me rephrase that. Because your house is cluttered, you start to clean out. There's a, there's a fact that, that it's something like 80% of the time that you clean out your house, you find money. You find money you didn't know you had. It may be change. Hey, I'll take it if you don't want it. It may be some, some award you won that you didn't know you had. It, it, it could be a number of different things, but, but people will tell you who deal with this business of cleaning out people's houses that 80% of the time, if not more, they find money. They find treasure that people didn't even know they had. Jesus has something for you this morning. I'm not talking about dollars. I'm not talking about treasure unless you take your treasure in heaven. But he says, come and be honest with me. Allow God to search your heart. Because there's some stuff, some junk, some debris, some barnacles, some clogs that are keeping you from serving Him. From knowing the reality of His presence in your life. Not just in eternity, but for right now. To that He says this morning, come. Let's pray together. Father, I've not said anything we don't know. But your word teaches us, Father, that, that we have 
the reality of moving away from you when you call us to move toward you. We fill our lives with all kinds of stuff when you call us to fill our lives with you. We get bent out of shape with other people, with, with, with church, with a lot of different things. And Lord, at the heart of it, at the heart of it is the, the debris, the clogging, the clutter we've allowed in our lives. Father, how many of us will be honest enough this morning to pray that prayer? Oh, search me, O oh God. See if there be wicked way in me. Put me on the way of life everlasting. Father, search our hearts as we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our invitation is going to be hymn number 297. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Will you stand with me? And let God work in your heart this morning. Let Jesus come into your heart. And my Christian friend, let him seek your heart. This altar is open for you to come, to get on your face before the Lord and say, Search me, O God, know my heart today. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every... Don't delay. This is the time God is speaking to your heart right now. Come on that next verse. I praise you, Lord, for cleansing me from sin. Fulfill your word and make me pure within. Fill me with fire where once I burned with shame. Grant my desire to magnify your name. Lord, take my life, for I would live for you. Fill my poor heart with your great love so true. Take all my will, my passion, self, and pride. I now surrender. Bow your heads, please. Right now, your mind immediately went to something else. But right now, your Holy Spirit is saying to you, Focus. I'm searching your heart. There's some stuff that's just not godly in you. And you're fighting that battle. Yeah, but, you know, yeah, but. Right now, let him search your heart. Let him clean the storage, the debris, the barnacles now Father, as we leave this time of worship, our worship doesn't stop. We call this the service, but the service begins when we walk out of this place. Father, take us to that, that, that place where we can study your word more this morning. Oh, Lord, don't let us get crowded with something else. Take us to Sunday school so we can study your word. 
And then take that word with us as we go, Father. Use us. Remind us, Lord, to, to, to be diligent about our field and about our wall. And may we honor you with our lives this day and each day. In Jesus' name, amen. See you tonight at 6 o'clock.